Thanks for coming. I'm super excited to be here at Saint Con. This is my first Saint Con. Um, got a slightly older version of my deck, but I think we're we're good to go. Um, so, does anybody here know what the average tenure of a CISO is today? Less than a year. That's a good guess. Anybody else? Eighteen to twenty-four months. Anybody else? Anyone, any other numbers you want to throw out there? Three years. Yeah. So. I did a lot of research on this topic, and it really depends where you look. Like, there's a lot of different studies. I saw anywhere from 18 months to five years. Um, but it, it feels like most of them are in the 24-month range, so I'm kind of sticking with 24 months, two years as, a, as an average across my research. Um, so a little bit about me, and there's a couple of the studies that I looked at on the bottom if you want to look at them for a reference. Uh, this ESI Thought Lab one and this uh, Hydric and Struggles, I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, Global CISO Survey. Uh, but my name is Russell Mosley, and uh, I've held CISO roles at two organizations. Uh, one was a, a pretty small tech company, software company, and um, they were really good about investing in cybersecurity, kind of taking the recommendations of the team, um, doing everything um, you know, that, we, that we thought should be done. And from there, I moved on and, uh, and took a CISO role at a much larger organization. Um, both of these are federal government contractors. Um, the larger one had just won a lot of work, and they were looking to grow from a few hundred people to well over 1,000, and they decided that they probably should start thinking about cybersecurity and wanted to hire their first CISO. So uh, I took that gig uh, with a lot of promises on the budget and resources that would come with it. And uh, that's why I'm now a recovering CISO, because it didn't work out that way. Um, I'm a principal consultant with CrowdStrike. Uh, I don't work on the product side. I work in uh, services on a team called Strategic Advisory. So in Strategic Advisory at CrowdStrike, we perform security assessments, and we perform or externally facilitate uh, tabletop exercises. So basically practicing your incident response process. And I really, really love doing that. Um, I've been on that team for a little over a year. Um, I run one of the tabletop teams at CrowdStrike, so that's what I get to do every day. Uh, tomorrow, I'm running a tabletop for um, a very large international law firm. Uh, next week, I'm running one for one of the big four airlines. It's a lot of fun. And uh, if anyone's interested in learning more about CrowdStrike, the work we do, we're also um, recruiting heavily, and I'd love to talk to you about uh, opportunities there. Uh, third, I'm a conference organizer. So I'm on the board of directors for uh, B-Sides Charm, and that's linked there on my Twitter. Um, back in Baltimore, I'm from, I'm from Maryland. And uh, I'm also a director with the Blue Team Village at DEF CON, uh, which if you haven't, haven't been to DEF CON, uh, along with the massive uh, main con, there are all these villages that focus on different areas, and there's like 20 of them. And the Blue Team Village is one of the first villages to focus really on enterprise uh, cybersecurity. And so I got involved with that a few years ago and, and helped run that event as well. Um, I also volunteer at a number of conferences every year. Uh, there's several B-sides back in the DC area, so I help with all of those. Um, and I was just at GERCON two weeks ago, and I've already seen a few people that I got to see there. Uh, I was doing his job on uh, one of the tracks at GERCON, setting up the speakers, uh, trying to help when their tech didn't work when they were giving presentations. Um, so really enjoy um, being at conferences and would love to get to know more of you. So why am I giving this talk? Um, well, as I kind of just described, I've been a CISO with a pretty supportive organization for cybersecurity. Great environment uh, to learn a lot and come up in. Uh, I've also been a CISO with a not so supportive organization. Um, and now I'm a consultant to CISOs. And a funny thing happened um, the first like six months at CrowdStrike into being a consultant. And that was that um, almost every client I had either had a new CISO, they had a CISO vacancy, or they had a CISO on the way out. It was, pretty stunning to see. I mean, I had read articles about the short tenure of CISOs, um, and as soon as I got into consulting, I immediately saw this, but I also saw the impact that it had on organizations with this turnover. <clears throat> so let's start at the beginning. Um, what's a CISO? This is a chief information security officer, supposedly the person that has overall responsibility for cybersecurity at an organization. Um, but if you ask around in the practitioner community or you know, look on InfoSec Twitter, you'll see that the more common description of the CISO role is that of scapegoat. Um, and I have kind of some tweets up here. I don't know if you can read all of them back there in the back of the room. 
But the perception here is that CISOs are frequently used as scapegoats when there's a security breach, and they are fired for it as a result. Um, now, something that I've more personally observed and felt as a CISO was that I was there really, you know, simply to check a box, right? We have a CISO, so cybersecurity is good, we're covered now, right? Was kind of what I felt and I've observed with a lot of other organizations that I've helped in my role at CrowdStrike. Um, I particularly like this tweet on the bottom right from Rich Mogul, uh, where he says, uh, job number one for CISOs is to be fired after a security incident. Job number two is signing audit paperwork. And somewhere down the stack, they do security stuff. Maybe, if they're lucky. Um, and I think that, that that rings true in my experience as well. So um, you've probably seen the cybersecurity product like mind map of all the different products. There's also ones for like all the different fields that you can use to show people just like how broad the field is. Um, here's one that I found for CISO responsibilities. And uh, just in the center there, you have building relationships, leading change, managing finance, managing supply chain, core behaviors, and leading people. And none of that is cybersecurity work, right? It's all management functions. Then you get out to the perimeter and you have management or oversight of security operations, governance, you know, risk, compliance, lots more. Um, but I think that's okay. Um, it's the job. CISOs should be prepared for this. So I'm not saying that this is an issue, it's just part of the equation to consider here. Um, in my observation, the biggest issue is really unrealistic expectations of a cybersecurity program, especially at all of the large, I'm sorry, the 99% of organizations that are not large enterprise. Everybody else seems to have unrealistic expectations of what cybersecurity can do uh, with limited resources, you know, with a very small team. Uh, so here's a, a meme that I think is pretty accurate for reflecting that, right? There's your perceived security plan, and, and then there's the, the budget, and then, of course, the expected ROI at the bottom. Um, I like this one for smaller organizations, you know. Like I said, you hired your CISO, so you're good, right? Well, if your budget likes that, looks like that, you know, you definitely don't have the tools for the job. <clears throat> Then there's the fact that CISOs aren't really chief of anything. So I'm curious what all of you think if the CISO, being that they're the chief information security officer, is really part of the C-suite. Anyone think they're part of the C-suite? That they're really a C-level executive? If they actually are. So, you know, it really depends on the company, but in most cases, uh, they're not. Um, generally, they tend to be um, director level, VP level. They're not really a full-fledged member of the C-suite. <clears throat> and this, is, this could be another entire talk, but if you haven't heard about it, you know, there's this supposed talent shortage in cybersecurity, right? Um, and I would agree that there is for, you know, the most experienced folks, there's definitely a shortage and a lot of opportunity. Um, but if you're not looking for a unicorn, there's, there's plenty of people out there. And if you're willing to train people, which is, again, another entire talk. Um, but have you ever looked at any CISO jobs on LinkedIn? Uh, I grabbed a few here uh, earlier this year. I gave this talk in May at, uh, at Nolicon. Um, so I've got three examples here. This Versant Health says there's 430 applicants for that one. Uh, Wish, 976 applicants. And uh, Tupperware got 317 applicants. Now, I don't know if there's bots or something doing this, um, but I know that when I was posting jobs in my last CISO role, I would get like 30 applications a day for security analysts and engineers, and they seem to be real people. Um, certainly massive numbers here, but really what I wanted to point out on this slide is if you look at each one, it shows the level of the role. So for Versant Health, it says full-time, director. For Wish, it says full-time, executive. And for Tupperware, it says full-time, mid to senior level. So even these companies don't really know where a CISO fits. <clears throat> uh, then there's the hiring process. Um, another trend that you'll learn about if you're not already familiar is when looking for cybersecurity roles, um, having to go through many rounds of interviews. 
So it's the same for CISOs. Um, this is from Nikki Bim. She posted this. I think this is LinkedIn. Um, she's an impressive leader. Um, I've had the chance to work with her, and uh, she was the CISO at uh, Carrier, right, the HVAC brand. Um, she says here she had 14 interviews with GE, 12 interviews with NBC, and neither one hired her. Uh, she's now the CISO at Rockwell Automation. Uh, congrats to her and them. But, but why is this? Like, why do we have to go through all of these uh, interviews to get hired? Um, hold on to that thought. Um, I think this is a really important part of the, of the equation is reporting structure. So if you're a CISO and you report to the CIO, your budget is essentially a line item in the IT budget. And it's a, it's a really common reporting structure, especially at less mature organizations in terms of their cybersecurity program. But now you're in a situation where you know, confidentiality is really competing with availability for, for dollars. Um, and I think that uh, CISOs really should be seen as there to protect the company's assets. Uh, in my opinion, they really shouldn't even report to the CEO because in this country, the job of the CEO is really to increase value for the organization. It's, it's not to protect assets, I would say, as a generalization. Um, and that CISOs rather should report to the CFO or the board or a risk officer if you have that. Um, based on the role and what they should be doing for these organizations. Uh, the, government, the government is actually taking notice. There was an SEC ruling, actually I think it was a proposal uh, for new rules that would require publicly held companies to have board directors with cybersecurity expertise. Um, now, I don't know if that will have any teeth and you have to define expertise, right? Um, but hopefully, um, you know, the government will, uh, as a result of all the breaches that we see happening all the time, um, help companies see the importance for cybersecurity expertise. But the reality is that um, CISOs are being used as scapegoats um, and as checkboxes for compliance. And they tend to be chiefs in name only. And usually they don't have sufficient resources to do their jobs. Uh, take a look at this budget I have circled here for a 1,200-person company, and they have one person listed for security. And this tweet from uh, GuidePoint Security, where companies are saying that cyber insurance is the first line of defense. <clears throat> um, I actually performed an assessment for a company this year that didn't have anyone uh, dedicated to cybersecurity. That was one of our recommendations, that they build out a team um, and start with somebody at least the director level. And this is a company with an $800 million a year budget um, with nobody dedicated to cybersecurity. It's really, it's kind of been surprising to me as a consultant, uh, the maturity overall out there, because I've had the opportunity to see some companies that do have really mature programs, but the majority in my experience uh, really don't, really have, a, really have a lot of work to do. And so this is the result. The CISOs are leaving. The average tenure is around two years. Uh, Coalfire even has a blog here on what to do when you are expecting your CISO to leave. And uh, you gotta love seeing things like the Life After CISO podcast. Um, there's one article there in the back, uh, it's above the Coalfire one, and it says that at the time, 24% of Fortune 500 CISOs were on the job for a year. And uh, I think that was from uh, 2020, and, and that largely matches uh, my, my consulting experience. So it's obvious to me why CISOs are leaving, um, you know, and there's a lot of ways you could sum it up, but I think that, you know, in general, it's a, it's a lack of support, it, it's burnout. Um, they have accountability for cybersecurity breaches without much ownership, and you're generally seen as a junior exec and a scapegoat. And uh, I like this quote here, eventually you get, uh, you get tired of trying to convince people of all the reasons why they should listen to you and you rage quit. <laughs> so what can we do? And I wanna talk about we as an us cybersecurity practitioners and then also talk about businesses and what can they do to improve this situation. So um, 
I see and hear and have said a lot of things like this uh, many times. It's, it's kind of never ending. You know, they won't get you what you need and then they blame you. Uh, all the execs have admin rights. I had to explain to my CIO that Macs do get viruses and I think that was like in 2016. Um, and of course, the, we have cyber insurance. You know, why do we need that? We have cyber insurance. Um, well, really, um, have you ever thought that it might be it might be us, or we might be a part of the problem? Yes, I, I have a hard time seeing with the lights. You, you one. What's that? We're compliant. We're compliant. Yes. <laughs> the box is checked. <laughs> um, if you put yourself in the shoes of the CIO or the CEO of the board. Um, you know, they ask us to give them a presentation, what we're going to spend our money on, what the results are, and a common question is like, well, if we do all this, are we secure? Right? Can we be secure? And what do we tell them? We tell them, no, you can never be fully secure, right? Like, you can spend all this money, but if there's a dedicated threat actor, they're still going to get in, no matter how much money we spend. So we tell them they can't be secure, and then we're surprised and we get upset when they would prefer to buy insurance rather than spending money on proactive cybersecurity. So I'd like you to kind of put yourself in, you know, from the lens of the CIO, the CEO, other business leaders, and think about it, try to think about it from their perspective a little bit. So um, uh, Malware Jake, Jake Williams, he gave a talk last year at Blue Team Con. Um, I was there and, and, and sat in his talk and took a lot of notes, and it was kind of the inspiration for me doing this. Um, his talk was called uh, Stop Talking Nerdy to Me, Translating the Value Proposition of the Blue Team to the C-Suite. And if you go look on YouTube, you can find it. I think he gave it at a few different events, and at least one of them recorded it. Um, and I think that he's really right, and uh, the talk is excellent. Um, you know, the point here, I think, is that we as, as cybersecurity professionals uh, fail at communicating to business leaders. And I, I like this visual here. You know, we show up with massive amounts of information, you know, jargon, lists of technical arguments to explain things, um, which really is a waste of time to these business leaders because they don't understand it the way we communicate. So we need to think about and learn to communicate in ways that business leaders will understand. Um, and in Jake's tweet, uh, if you can't read it, what he's saying is, if you want to turbocharge your InfoSec career, head over to the Harvard MBA reading list. Pick a book on business case studies and start using those to analyze, I'm sorry, inaugula, I, I can't pronounce that, InfoSec issues to the BU leadership. Their analogies won't be perfect, but they didn't understand you at all before. And um, I think it's a great, it, it's a really a great suggestion, uh, the Harvard MBA reading list, if you have a chance even to read just a few of those books, especially if you have interest in uh, cybersecurity leadership role at some point in your career, it will, it will really be helpful. Um, so someone I used to work with, he liked to say to me, stop admiring the problem. Um, when I was giving him all the reasons why we should do something differently or, you know, invest in something new. And I really love that line. So I think here that, you know, really the approach we should take when talking to business leaders is to ask them what the organization's concerns are about cybersecurity and then shut up and listen. You know, listen to what the business is concerned with. Then after you've done that, suggest solutions to reduce risk. And this is really more going back to uh, Malware Jake's talk uh, last year at Blue Team Con. This was his suggestion. Um, that to succeed, we need to propose change in the language of business, not tech jargon. And understand that business is about risk. I mean, also profit, but ultimately business decisions tend to be made based on risk. So this thread was interesting, and I love the reply to my comment here. But I was just posting in response to some thread about, you know, CISOs making headway that when I was a CISO, I, tend, I tended to make the most progress at coffee, uh, at lunch, and at, you know, non-business meetings. Um, talking to people, asking them about their kids, asking them what they did this weekend, because I think it's about building trust and, and relationships more than anything else. You know, if you just invite business leaders to meetings and tell them that you need them to do things, 
like, well, what's in it for them? Like, you're making them defensive, right? You're, you're basically giving them work without helping them understand why they have that work. Um, and so I think it's really important to try to build relationships in what you do. All right, so what about businesses? <clears throat> I think it boils down to one word, that they really need to invest in cybersecurity. You know, they need to stop looking at security as overhead and really start looking at it as an investment. But it's up to us, the cybersecurity workforce, to influence them to do that. I don't think that they're really going to learn this on their own. So start thinking about cybersecurity as asset protection or loss avoidance. So really along the lines of insurance. Also consider that cybersecurity investment, it frees IT to support revenue generating operations by having a separate security team from IT. And this is one of those steps in maturity, right? You have IT first, then you have dedicated security people who probably start in IT before you have a separate cybersecurity program. And by having that separate cybersecurity program, you can free those IT people to do what they're there for, right? Supporting revenue. Um, also, businesses need to take a risk-based approach to cybersecurity, which I mentioned before. Learn about the organization's risk, then look at where you have risks from a cyber perspective in that overall risk program. Don't build for compliance. It's a good place to start if for really immature cybersecurity programs. You've always got that hammer if you have to meet compliance. But risk should be the focus. Um, and I also think that this is really important to treat staff as investments. Give them what they need, tools, training, time off, um, raises to stay current with market value, which is, seems to be very rare. You know, in most cases, people have to change jobs to, to move up and to really be compensated the way that they should be. And so to validate some of these points, I just wanted to quickly share um, a few highlights from one of my favorite studies on the ROI of cybersecurity. And I mentioned this one earlier. This is um, ESI Thought Lab. They published this study in 2020 about uh, driving cybersecurity performance. And they surveyed about 1,000 companies for this. So it was pretty broad. Um, and they rated the cybersecurity maturity, the investments, the plans and practices of all these different organizations, and then presented their analysis. So I just want to share a few quick nuggets. Uh, first, they said in here that uh, cybersecurity leaders, in this case leaders, they mean the leading organizations, the ones that had the best cybersecurity program, uh, that had reduced risk the best with cybersecurity, those organizations give CISOs a larger business role. Um, so it says that, like part the way down the first paragraph there, um, that uh, the role of the CISO is really moved from a generalized IT role to that of a specialized cyber risk manager. And in these firms, CISOs typically share more responsibility for things like digital transformation and data privacy. Uh, they also tend to be uh, involved in more diverse business areas like operational resiliency, uh, product development, supply chain management, and even uh, geopolitical risk management for larger organizations. They also published this list of the best practices of the cybersecurity leaders that they observed. And I wanted to call out a few statements here. Um, and number one, if you can't read it, um, they said that leaders invest 25% more than non-leaders on cybersecurity per employee and increase that investment more each year than the average. So this goes to reinforcing the need for investment. <clears throat> and number three, cybersecurity leaders have the CISO report to the CEO, the COO, or the board. Uh, there's other good stuff in there as well, um, but those go to my earlier points. And they consistently use the word invest here, uh, saying that greater cybersecurity investment generates um, an ROI of close to $2 for every dollar spent. Now, of course, you have to consider who are the people who um, paid for the study, and there are a lot of cybersecurity companies in there. Just wanted to point that out. Um, but they also said that leaders that spend 20% uh, more per employee on cybersecurity than the non-leaders do. Um, and then they also talked about investing in people. And they said that uh, investing in uh, resources and training is a key plank of any successful cybersecurity strategy, that the leading organizations invest more in skills, training, and resources, and that investing in people brings the biggest reduction in risk. So what does the future hold for the CISO role? Well, certainly higher salaries, particularly after the, um, the Uber CEO was held liable for the cover-up of their 2016 hack. 
Um, the article on the right, what's next for CISOs, this is from that Hydric and Struggle study that I mentioned earlier. And it says something interesting in there, that the majority of CISOs that they, um, that they polled want to be something other than a CISO, and that more than half of them want to be board members. <clears throat> and the black box that's hidden in the back there, um, it says that the role of the CISO should die that there should be a CRO, a chief risk officer, and a VP of InfoSec, with the tech managed by the VP of InfoSec, and the executive is the risk officer. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at CrowdStrike's Falcon, it's, the, it's our user conference, and uh, George Kurtz mentioned in his keynote that something that CrowdStrike is observing is that as boards of directors of organizations are turning over, we are seeing um, an increase in a trend of former CISOs being added to boards. And uh, we are, we're hoping that this is a trend that will continue um, because it means that uh, there will be more consideration for cybersecurity at the board level. And I think that's also exciting for all of us, uh, especially, especially if you have career aspirations for a cybersecurity leadership role that we hopefully will see more people at higher levels of organizations with a cybersecurity background. So these are my conclusions. Uh, cybersecurity leadership is definitely a challenging role. Um, success requires tech and business savvy. I think we all could stand to learn more about business and try to look at things through the eyes of the business leaders. Business leaders need help understanding the value proposition of cybersecurity investment. And it's really up to us to make that happen. And businesses should also invest more in people training, and stop only hiring the unicorns. Uh, and my closing thought is this, uh, never take a CISO role without a guaranteed exit package. Thank you. <laughs>